this session is called it's time to be unapologetically black at work and we are fortunate and i use the word fortunate because carol is booked and busy <laughs> we're fortunate to have carol campaign in our midst today she is the director at diversity practice and she's the founder at different women different places and where even i actually saw carol speak and we were just blown away by how unapologetic you are by how candid you were in your conversation so we kind of like reached out so we've got to get carol we've got to get carol unfortunately she's here with us today so i'm really excited to hear you speak now the title wasn't this before if you saw the earlier flyers it was a very um how can I put it? Muted title. And Carol was like, no, 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 we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about, which is being unapologetically black. So I'm going to hand over to Eve Youngo, who is going to facilitate the conversation, and I'll just be in the background. So over to you, Eve. Thank you, Tenny. As she said, we are just so excited to have Carol here today. Um, so I'm going to be kicking us off with, with the first question, which is, why is it important for us to own our own narrative? Thanks, Eve. And it's great, actually, it's really great to be here this afternoon. I mean, it, it, it's actually become part of my, my legacy is to really ensure that I'm spending and I'm investing my time in helping to grow and shape, you know, young black Asian women like, like yourselves and those who are listening. So. I'm absolutely just delighted. And so the kind of question um, was in terms of owning your own story. And I'd like to kind of rewind a little bit to your original title, right? Can you remind me, what, what was the original title of this session? It was around navigating the workplace as a, well, we didn't even add race into the question, so it was navigating the workspace. Right, navigating the workplace. Now, now, remember the conversation that we had was in the middle of this global pandemic, COVID-19. Um, I think it was also around the time of the death of George Floyd. And you know, we're now absolutely in the midst of seismic, real seismic big shift for us as black people. Um, and also for, for black women. And so when I heard that, I just went, what? You know, and there's something really important that links to owning your narrative. Mm -hmm. And owning your narrative and owning your story, the kind of key question for me has always been, if you don't own your story, if you don't know what your story is, if you don't tell your story, do you think it's going to sit somewhere uninterpreted? And the answer to that is absolutely a non-negotiable no. The fact is that if you don't own your own story, believe you me, and we now know, it's now really clear, other people will interpret what your story is. They will tell your story and they'll blame it all on unconscious bias. And that story will be filled with nuances and bias and stereotypes and racism and prejudice and presumptions and all of those things and in my kind of journey having done different women twice now and different women as a study first did it in 2007 when I looked around and noticed that you know when we're talking about gender and talking about women you know women like the three of us like here right now we're not we're just not considered at all and I remember picking up the phone and I, I called Cranfield the Cranfield Business School um, and I had a conversation with a very well-renowned professor. And she said to me, you know, there's no point in doing that. This work has already been done in the States. And I said, well, that's not the experience of black women, Asian women in the United Kingdom or in Europe. And basically she slammed the door. And so from that point onwards, I was really keen to tell your story so that people can understand the value that you bring and really shift from this negative stereotypical perception of who we are and so in terms of telling that story it's so critical that we step in and own that narrative and own it in a powerful way and kind of now now more than now more than ever 
and you know, I can see like as young millennials, we looked at millennials too. Um, you know, as the younger generation, you're great at telling your Insta stories and your Snapchat stories and those kind of stories. And there's, there's also, and what's next? And what's the reality of that? So that's why I think it's really important to own who you are. And do you feel like from that, we're, we're on a journey in a sense, so you can't just wake up one day and say, look, my story is this. It's a journey, especially with the younger generation or, or what was your journey like? Well, first, I mean, I'll, I'll absolutely talk to you about my journey, which is probably going to be quite different. Um, but the notion that owning your story, it kind of takes a long time. You have to grow into your story. Is a bit of a myth. We have no time. There is no time. Really slam that. We don't have time to really stand up and step into our leadership and seize the moment and advocate for change. And um, the time is, you know, the time is absolutely now. There was a rabbi who said, if not now, when? Mm. And there are just so many other ways in which the kind of younger generation, I think, and in terms of the research that I've done, are really aware, you know, you are the, the you know, you're the woke generation, right? So socially conscious, you know, you're standing and advocating for social justice. We, we see that with Black Lives Matter. It's all the kind of younger people that are out there in the street. But somehow, I think what happens is that um, women like you come and the ladies at lunch, you know, come into the corporate, come into the kind of corporate world, and your badge of honor is that you've got this great job um, in a great organization that might be global or otherwise. And I'm using the word great to in parallel with great because maybe brand and position, not necessarily a great place to work, but great for those other things. And there's an invisible contract that you sign, and it goes something like this. Yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely, Kenny, Eva, I will give you this job. But here's the thing. Leave 60% of who you are at the door. Mm -hmm. And don't worry, we'll make up that 60%. And before you know it, you're, you know, you're assimilating. They say the easiest way to kill a frog, sorry if you're a bit squeamish, is to boil it really slowly. Mm -hmm. like, what is boil it really slowly. But before you know it, you're assimilated and you've changed your name so that people find it easier to pronounce. You've um, spoken, you start to speak in a particular way. You don't really challenge the status quo because you don't want the label of the aggressive or the oppressed downtrodden Asian woman or the aggressive black woman. And your authenticity is completely compromised. And I suppose, I, I guess, practitioners like me, coaches like me, walk into these organizations when they decide to do leadership development for ethnic minorities, because you're never in the room when they do leadership development for women, because women means white, so you're actually not in those. Um, and our, my job is to help to reposition you, to get you to reset, to really take ownership of who you are, understand that value that you bring. Um, and so the journey thing is now, right? It's not tomorrow. It's absolutely now. And I guess around my my journey, very kind of varied, you know, very varied. And so you might hear in my accent, I was actually born in, in Glasgow. I know that's a bit weird. Um, so born in Glasgow, my dad, my father was Nigerian, my mother from, from Trinidad. And very early on, I mean, I was the only black girl that looked like me um, in the school that I went to. So I used to do strange things like put a towel on my head to get a sense of motion and all that kind of rubbish. Um, you know, I wanted blonde hair and all of those kinds of funny things. And my father made a decision as a doctor that he was not, same story that we're seeing now, that he was not progressing and decided to take us back to live in Nigeria. And that changed my life completely. And I know I wouldn't be sitting in this chair today having this kind of conversation had that not been the case. I went to the best school ever. It was called International School in Ibadan. It's amazing. But anyway, 
that's another story. Um, and I guess my, my journey, that's when I discovered how important identity is. And that's when my story began to shift and change, came back to this country, got married, worked in the not-for-profit sector, where again, I was kind of socially conscious and fighting for the rights of unemployed black men and women, and then worked for a university, became head of diversity, taught there. And I think I just continued to be a voice for change. Um, so that the diversity practice became a coach. And I guess the rest is, is history really in that sense. Wow, that is just so impressive. And I know we were talking, um, you know, in preparation for this and you were saying that you'd like to hear what what the ladies in our network feel stops them, you know, bringing their full self to work or, or being who they are. So I'm just going to take this time to ask if any ladies on the call feel comfortable, please share in the chat box, um, you know, if there is anything in particular preventing you from being your whole self at work, um, put that on the chat and we'll we'll look at that um, when we get to the Q&A session at the end. So thanks. Um, on to the next question. Questions. Um, how do we, so we've talk, talked about, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter movement and, mm. and now and COVID and the implications of it on our community. How do we make this more than a moment? How do we make it more than just the press talking about it for five minutes from, you know, more than just changing uh, your 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 photo on social media to a black image for, for one day? How do we make it more than a moment? And what should we be doing to ensure we are working to, towards long lasting forever change as you put it yeah long and then it is i mean that again is another one of my kind of non-negotiables and i i want to begin that question by kind of referring to your the title of this conversation um which is you know being unapologetically black at work right mm -hmm. and that title in and of itself says a lot it kind of says that at some point before we agreed that that would be the title there was a lot of apologizing that was going on, yeah. right? Right, there was a lot of, um, it, you know, I suppose in academic terms, it's called stereotype threat, not wanting me to be associated with, with the stereotype, constantly almost having to say, I'm sorry for being, you know, I'm really sorry for being who I am. Let me try to be different. And so there's a, there's a, there's a strong link between that state of consciousness, that, that mindset, mm -hmm. and making sure that this moment becomes a movement and lasts. And so there is a transition that I guess we all have to make to really kind of stand in, in that place where we are unapologetic and we're in this for the long, you know, we're playing the long game. Corporate, kind of white corporate UK, I, and I know in terms of conversations, are hoping that this is a moment. They really are. They're really hoping. And their mindset and their, their chatter and their conversation might be, oh, wow, we shocked. Somehow, we didn't know that racism exists in this country. So initially, there was a lot of conversation about it's an American problem, hmm. but we know that black lives are, you know, are wasted in police custody. We absolutely know that the experiences that we have from birth to death as black women. So black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth than their white female counterparts to death. On death certificates in this country, your ethnicity is not registered. We know that if you go to university as a black person, you're more likely to leave university with a two two and a third than you are to a first or two one. And I've worked in university. Even you, you might come into that university with the same grades as your white counterparts, but that's mm -hmm. 
that those are some of the things that we we absolutely know. And I, I really challenge us all to think about what's tell me one sector, right? One place or space in our life where issues of race and racism and inequality and discrimination just don't exist. Tell me one. That's not just one. And so what that means is that we have become kind of conditioned and coming back to apologetic, you know, it's no different to if you've experienced any form of abuse, you kind of get used to it in some ways. And we've got used to that. And really my prayer is that now that the ugly genie is out of the bottle, it's on, this is on the table. There is nowhere to hide. And so there's, there's something that's just so important that this is not a flash in the pan. Breonna Taylor, right? Um, George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey, Stephen Lawrence. I could go on and on and on. What does it take? Do we have to really die for us as a people and for, for us, as, for you as young leaders to know that you've got, you absolutely do have um you know that you actually do have a cause and the other thing i think i shared yesterday so here's the thing that did you know that 70 percent of people in the world are non-white 70 percent of women in the world are non-white we somehow mm -hmm. just don't we don't know that and wouldn't it be powerful and this is a moment to kind of really absolutely kind of get to grips with that because we have a cause, you know, I want you to be able to look at your children and go 2020, right? I was one of those women who turned this from a moment in time, right, into a forever moment. And so that I think is, that's the, that is, that is the, the call. So the questions come back to who do we need to be to make sure that it's not just a moment and who do you need to be differently? You know, in your corridors of influence, finding your voice, being that voice, not kind of being muted when it's not heard, but really kind of stepping into becoming those that, that kind of agent of change, mm -hmm. right? That is that real agent, that real agent of change. Those are some of the things that, that I think are really important um, in this moment. Otherwise, the moment will pass and it will just be that. That's powerful. Thank you. Look kind of convicted. It's like, <laughs> I'm just like, yes, <laughs> let's go. Let's go. And yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's, that. that's not about navigating the court. What was it, the initial title? Navigating. navigating. <laughs> Yeah, yeah um, and even then, you know, in terms of navigating the workplace, you know, the same, the same individuals, right, who are silent or who might be unconsciously biased or consciously so, are judging you as you navigate. I'm making decisions about you as you navigate the workplace. So you better be awake and conscious, right? None of this half asleep and I love ladies at lunch, but ladies at lunch have work to do. Yeah, we're doing both. <laughs> <laughs> ladies at lunch and work. <laughs> yeah, ladies at lunch have a calling. Ladies at lunch have a lot. You know. And and I, I don't say that in a um I don't this is not about giving you oh something else to do. Because we know from different women that um women like us in the in the workplace, and I'm sure you've all heard this, kind of work twice as hard. It's called the John Henry effect. So John Henry mm -hmm. is this mythical African-American man who used to work the fields. And um, when they brought in industrialized machinery to do the same thing, he wanted to prove that he was as strong as that industrial machine. And so he set himself a task to prove that and died in the process. And so there is a, an important place for us um, as black women 
as Asian women, as different women, to take care of self and to take care of each other. And that's the beauty of, of ladies, ladies at lunch and that your network and your network that can have some of the critical conversations that you need to have, you can support each other so that when you step back into the workplace, you are, you know, you are stronger, you are wiser, you are more focused, you're more strategic, you're owning your narrative, you're making change, and you're looking after yourself. So it's kind of all of those things. Yeah. That's wow. the journey. I'm ready for it after this. I'm ready. <laughs> and it's important, um, it's important to be that. Just tying into that. So ultimately, you've touched on, upon it slightly. Um, what is the bigger picture and what does success look like? And so I guess there's this part of me that I want to, I, I thought about that question too. And of course, I have a, you know, I have an answer and that answer will be my answer, you know, will be my response. And I think it's, this is where we can have a conversation, right? G given the landscape as we've, you know, as I've kind of tried to describe it, and I know there's probably more and I could go on and on. Uh, what, what do, what's success for you? What does that look like for you? I know that I'm the one being interviewed, but I just thought I'd just flip the script. You want me to go? Yeah. For me, it would be a world where you don't have to work twice as hard, where you're accepted on merit and you can comfortably sit in your seat knowing that you're accepted for who you are. You don't have to censor yourself to appease anybody else. That would be success for me in a world where we're just equal mm -hmm. and you're accepted for the greatness that you are. And right now I feel like, like you said, we have to work twice as hard and we have to go above and beyond. And our, count our counterparts are doing the bare minimum and we've got the same title. That world doesn't sit right with me, so. Yeah. Okay. I'll give it a go after that. I guess it's similar. For me, it's more that, um, you know, equity, equality in, in opportunity, um, you know, go into a job interview and and having in my heart the 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 feeling that you know I have a chance not not wondering if it's my name if it's what I wear how I dress my my hair that's gonna stop and um you know give someone an opinion of me that that has no actual like foundation or forming so I think it's that and then also when you look in terms of history it's that acknowledgement of of what black people have done in the world not just that whole negative stereotype it's the acknowledgement of you've done this you've built this this is a contribution that we've um given to society and i think that is what is so lacking in not just the uk but across the globe it's that acknowledgement of this is what you've done this is who you are and you know you are great as, as a community, you are great and you've contributed so much to the world in ways that, you know, the the rest of the world is indebted in a sense. Um, so, yeah. That's so, great. I mean, it, it, I know and that's, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And and the, the, I think what's behind that question for me is that we all know the answer to that, right? Mm. We absolutely know what that world looks like there's part of me that thinks when i when i watch black panther which i watch i've watched it about 50 times i keep watching it like every time like i'm watching it. you know but panda is a real place it's a place that many countries in africa in the caribbean would have been if we were not colonized in the way that we were that and that there's there's a real there's a real truth in that Mm -hmm. Equally, when, when I think about, you know, when I think about different women and I think about black excellence or brown excellence, it's, it's, it's clear to me that if you have worked twice as hard, and, I, and of course we put a caveat to that, you've got to look after yourself, and so there's a bit of a stop doing that if you are. Um, 
if you've navigated these corporate landscapes that are, are judging you based on the color of your skin, what your hair looks like, how you dress, where you come from, what your name is, and so on and so forth, and yet you still rise, right? Mm. You're still progressing and making waves. It really strikes me that if I want to understand what resilient, excellent leadership looks like, then I need to look at you, mm. right? I really do, because that's where the great lessons that's where the great lessons lie. And until countries, systems that exist in this country and um, across Europe, United States of America, places like Brazil, and so until there's a real recognition that this is the value that we bring, and until we own that narrative, <laughs> coming back to where we started, and we tell that narrative really confidently until we're willing to be kind of radical in our organizations and take a risk right mm -hmm. and really take take a risk to deconstruct systems of of oppression to really deconstruct them to really challenge them to hold them to account you know until our white counterparts deal with their you know, we talk about privilege and the privilege is actually, it's undeserved, right? I just happen to have found gunpowder, maybe. It's undeserved privilege. You know, until we face up to those kind of things and lay that privilege down, then we're not going to be successful. We'll just be, you know, we'll be teetering at the margins. And that's what success really looks like, like for me. Um, success looks like the day that we really stand tall, and I think I think this is this is a moment. You know, this is very much a moment where, you know, I'm hearing black voices in a way that I I haven't heard them before, right? Yes. I'm hearing black voices now, like I'm hearing them, and they are unapologetic, and they're coming out from. You know, whether it's things like from America's Got Talent to Britain's Got Talent to The Voice, you know, all those kind of reality TV programs. Um, you know, Leona Lewis is telling her, you know, her story to higher education, to the NHS, to insurance, to assurance. I mean, professional stuff, so it's, it's on. Mm. It's, it, you know, it really is on. It's on right now. So as you said, let's go, let's make a, a good go of it and look after ourselves in the process. I hope that's been, I know I went around a bit, but there's a lot of areas to kind of try to, to cover. I see so much, so much have, has been learned. I know we've got questions already um, coming in and some comments as well, I think to your answer, Eve. So I don't know if you, if you can see those or if you want me to read them out. Um, uh, I can see them, so I'll let you go on that thing. So the one that I can see is sometimes you just want to avoid the questions. So you would rather not do or say certain things that are intrinsic to who you truly are for peace. It's unfair and involves too much thinking. I, you know, I, I, I absolutely get that. Um, and we talk, we talk about weathering and that's why I talked about the importance of, of taking care, taking care of self. And I guess you can avoid the question for so long. And it comes back to what I tried to say at the beginning. If you're not responding to what those questions are, you become part of that silent majority. Right? You become part of that silent majority, but your silence is coming from, it, you know, it is coming from a different place. Um, and that silence will be filled by someone else. And that's all about your personal leadership. And so, you know, I guess this, this conversation is beginning to, you know, maybe provoke a different way of thinking, but it's full of self-compassion. Yeah, it is full of self-compassion. And it, it's also kind of quite clear that you're on this journey anyway, so let the journey matter. Mm. Let the journey matter to, you know, let the journey matter to you. I get it. 
I still get, I still get this it. Is, this is another thought. So somebody said, I don't necessarily agree with the notion of bringing your whole self to work. The sad reality is that being a minority in a majority white space means that they will never assimilate the same way um, we have been conditioned to. So I like to flip the statement, bring the best part of yourself that needs to be, that, that is needed to do well, because they will never fully accept us for who we are through and through. Thoughts on this? Is it about them accepting you for who you are or you accepting yourself for who you are? And that's that's kind of where, you know, that that's that's absolutely where where it begins. And you know, I've had lots of conversations with people around, well, what do you mean bring your whole self to work? Um, I can choose, you know, and I, I love what you know, I love what that person has said. Bring your best self. And be authentic in that in that process. You know, authenticity is all is all about being your you know being your best self more with skill. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're doing that in a skill. You're really doing that in a skillful way. And you don't. I think it's really also important not to resign yourself to, and they will never accept, mm -hmm. um, and they will never adjust. And I know that early on in my career. I kind of had that as that something that kind of lived within me and I resigned myself to well what's the point and and, and let me try to let me try to fit in and then I discovered that actually that did not work for me I was not get I was not progressing at the same rate as my counterpart and so it, there was a bit of a switch where I went well okay I know who I am, I know whose I am, and let me be that, and let me be comfortable in, you know, let me be comfortable in my own skin. And the conversation I'm having with you, everyone will have a different strategy and a different way. So this is not a, here are the 10 things that you need to do. <laughs> and that's part of the journey of self-discovery for you as, as, as women, um, in terms of your own leadership, but it's just so important that you get to make the decision about how who who shows up and how you show up in the world. That I think is is really important. Eva, have you got the next question? No. Okay, I can take it. Um, so, as a black woman who has experienced racism for a very long time. How do you start to fight back and earn your authority? Surely it's not too late to start. I love that. It's 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 so never too late. I'm sending you lots of, you know, love for that for that question. Um, you know, racism, as we've seen and we know, I think we do know, as as black as black women who navigate this landscape, you know, racism kills at every level. Right. I, I kind of sometimes I refer to racism as a form of emotional terrorism. It, it really is. It's, you know, when you've been, you know, when you've had a paper cut, have you ever cut yourself a paper? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. It, it, it's kind of experiencing a million paper cuts. And so I, I still come back to how important it is to, you know, to self care. Um, and there are many different ways to fight back. We're having a conversation. We are in the arena. Rennie Brown talks in Daring to Lead. He talks about being in the arena, and that's where we are. When we also think of Toni Morrison, Toni Morrison talks about racism as a distraction. And it is a, it is, it's so insidious. Racism will demand that there's always something else you need to do right so whether it's you work, need to work twice as hard you need to change the way you speak um you need not to fall into the stereotype you need to tone down your voice they're just you know you need to prove to us that um you were you know you were civilized in different parts of africa before there's always another thing to prove it's a distraction don't be distracted right work on your purpose, work on your vision, 
align yourself ontological security with great people, ladies at lunch, grind yourself in your faith if you have a faith. Own, really own that. That's work on self. Because you can't fight if you don't have the tools. You can't fight if you've lost your voice. You can't fight if you fought in so many different ways that you're weathered, you're exhausted, you're tired. There are places to reset, to recuperate. And, you know, I always also say that, um, you know, you fight, if that's, and I think that's the that's word, because I do think we are in a war. Um, but you fight with your head and your heart. Right? You, you know, you, you absolutely, and sometimes it is a frontal attack where you're calling things out. Right, and, and sometimes it's more guerrilla warfare. Yeah, and, and all the time you're never doing it alone, never doing it alone. So you're building your relationships as you, you know as, as you go, and you're being authentic to you, and you're not fighting with yourself. So absolutely, it's never too late. But as we start again, let's start this battle differently. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to, it's, it, it's a different battle. It feels different this time. I think we were saying it, does, it, right? it feels like a shift. We've had these, these conversations before, but we've never felt so empowered in our voice. And I don't think we've ever been as unapologetic about our voice. Like I know a lot of ladies who are from different ages, different sen levels of seniority. It's the same conversation we're taking to our management. It's, it's just now or never. Um, so I don't think we've ever had a moment like this. So. And I guess, and there's also a lot to be said, Tenny, about, so why were we the way we were before? There's a lot of learning in that. You know, there's a, there's a huge amount of, so what, what was there? What was it that got in the way? And then there's also a bigger question. I think I, I, I read it yesterday, um, and it was focusing on the number of black women who die as a result of police brutality in, in the States and other places, other countries. Um, and um, the question was, I don't know whether you know, there's this whole thing called Say Her Name, because mm -hmm. a huge furore when George Floyd died, Breonna Taylor was murdered at home. Mm -hmm. She was shot eight mm -hmm. times. And kind of, so what was, you know, what was the, res you know, what was the response to that? Why didn't we respond in the same way? And there's so much learning from pausing. Yep. Does it take, why does it take this brutal murder of a Breonna, Breonna Taylor as an example? Why does it take that for us to find, to have a voice? Mm. What is it that we, you know, may historically, and that, to someone else's point who who sent in a question you know when you're working in these large corporate environments you your mindset is the organization is bigger than i am right the system is bigger than i am and yet if you're leading from a place of character the mindset is i carol i am bigger than the organization and we hold kind of holding on to that is is i think another you know i'm trying to share lots of important lessons that i've learned i mean i'm probably double your age and so um there's something to be said about that that journey and also something to be said about seizing the moment too yeah so someone said something that has stopped them being their authentic self is fear of saying something wrong or people's reaction to them you know, all of these things. I wish I could see all of you, um, so that you know you're you're hearing me nod nod my head. The whole concept of of fear, and I, I don't know for you in your personal lives. You know, when you've made a decision and you come to a place where you say not, right, and you change your course and you change the way that you do things. It's fascinating how people around you adjust to that, right? Fascinating how everyone goes, oh, okay. Right, so you've you've put a boundary, you know, you've put a boundary in place. And so to the person that asked that question, know that your voice, your voice matters. I mean, this is the kind of hashtag of Black Lives Matter and you matter. And 
that whole notion of facing your fear and doing it anyway. You know, permission to try, permission to have a go and see what happens. And, you know, see, see what happens. And we learn more from what we don't get right, right? You learn more from your failures than you do your successes. But we're afraid to, we're afraid to even try. And we also hear that same thing from our white colleagues at work. And I've heard this a lot. It's like, I don't want to hear this anymore. This is part of the system. Oh, the reason why I don't want to talk about race and never have is because I don't want to offend anyone. So for fear of offense, we do nothing. When we do nothing, nothing changes. And every, everything remains the same. So at some point, it's pushing past that fear, right? Moving out your comfort zone into the fear zone so that we can learn and then grow and change. But you've got to push past that. So to whoever asked that question, I mean, you know, you can talk to me offline. I'll work on your fear. <laughs> <laughs> but if you still have questions, please do send them in. We've still got time for a few more. I suppose one thing I have been conscious of now is that I feel like corporations are going to start to just promote people and put people in posi certain positions just to be seen to be more inclusive. And how should what should be our reaction to that? Because do I think we deserve it? Yes. Yeah. Um, how would it be received? I don't know. You know, some people then look, oh, she's just in her seat. And it's been said, you know, in Ladies at Lunch, a lot of people have felt the token, it felt like they're just the token black. And, you know, that, that brings some discomfort, whereas I believe in a meritocracy, but I also believe more needs to be done to, to reach wider. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I love, I love this notion of meritocracy. Meritocracy, that notion lives in utopia, actually. True. You know, True. they talk a lot about it's a meritocracy then if it and I, I had this conversation a few days ago with some you know very quite quite senior leaders that i was working with i said well if it's a meritocracy and we promote it just so happens that we said someone you know that we promote the best people for the job right and it just so happens that you know they they're they're white and i said well how come the best people for the job are always white mm. That's and, and I said, well, if that's, if that's the case, and I've got to accept that there's something fundamentally not quite adding up in my grey matter. Mm. In other words, I, I just don't have the competence and the capability. And I can't reconcile that. I don't believe in eugenics. I, I really, mm. you know, I can't reconcile that. And human beings, in terms of the brain, we're naturally biased. Right, even the sheep in the field, this great exercise that was done in Oxford, and they they observed sheep, black sheep and white sheep in a field. All the black sheep congregated together and all the white sheep congregated together. And there's lots of work, and I'm not going to kind of bore you around, but bias is real and it exists and it delivers outcomes. The other thing about tokenism is this. When we think that in terms of the legal framework in this, you know, kind of in this in this country, positive discrimination is illegal, right? So there isn't really any chance of anybody being a token. You are where you are because, you know, as you you are talented enough and you you are good enough. And that's kind of part of the myth of racism, right? And some of and that, and you know, if we want to be un, unapologetically black at work. We've got to debunk some of these myths. And one of them is, well, they might think I'm a token. Or again, I hear it when I'm doing lots of inclusion work. Well, we don't want to just put women in, or we don't just want to put black people in just because. And I'm like, but you never do. Okay, so let's, let's stop talking about the things that you and I know you never do, and you're not likely to do. So that's not that's a that's another distraction. We end up having a conversation with ourselves around, I don't want to be the token, when that's not even on the cards. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's not, it's not on the cards. And equally, when black women, women like us are promoted and we get into these more senior positions, the system, the environment around us has got to be inclusive enough so that we can thrive, mm -hmm. right? 
that it, it has to be it's it's both ends there's no point in okay we get those positions and coming back to the fight the fight yeah. takes on a completely different thing yeah so it's all of those things working together yeah I, I, I honestly, in my working life, I have not met many, I've not met any black tokens. I, and I, I yeah. It's, it's funny you should say that because I spent the first couple of months in my seat as in my underwriting journey on my grad scheme. It was a very diverse entry. Um, there were six of us, one black boy, one black girl, one mixed race boy, one Chinese boy. It was just like a very blatant attempt to approach the diversity issue that was existing in the company but and I got one of the seats that was most revered if you like but I spent like the first three months thinking why why me like why did I sit why, why me why was I chosen and do I think I'm capable absolutely but it's just that feeling of I'm why do I have to feel grateful as well for getting the best seat or not to say it was the best placement on, but why do I have to feel grateful for that when I when I know I'm capable I know I deserve it but I spent the first three months thinking mm, should I be in this seat? And then the rest of it, feeling grateful. I don't like that feeling. Yeah, so get rid of it. Um, so, <laughs> like you said. I was going to say, I identify with know, it too. Yeah, there's the other side of you that's saying, I am more than capable and I should be here. And there are lots of messages. When we did different women, different places, um, on both occasions, some of the messages that different women were getting from school, were so negative, actually. It's all about what you couldn't do, what you couldn't achieve. I mean, there were certainly occasions, some like 20% said they got very positive messages, but a swathing larger number said that the messages they got were not positive. And there's some messages that we have absorbed, right? We yeah. have absolutely absorbed a number of different things. I don't know if you've watched the, on YouTube, it's something called, um, the, it's an experiment called the Black Doll Experiment. Mm. Oh, you really should, should, should watch that. Um, and they have these dolls and one is, one is a, you know, and one is a, a, a white doll that's blonde and the other is a, is a black doll. And these three, four year old children, young girls are asked, so who's the pretty doll? Mm. Okay. Right? Which, which, doll is, which doll is the ugly doll? When and so who's the pretty doll, the lighter doll? Who is the ugly doll, the black doll, this child points to, and which one looks more like you? It's a very, it's a three minute yes. clip. So this is like at a very young age, some of these messages are perpetuated, you know, through what we watch, what we read. You know, you go in, you know, you go into, into a shop, you look at magazines, you see yourself reflected and there are these subtle messages that are really powerful, that have been communicated all the time, and we absorb those things. Um, and and there's, there's a name for it, it's called internalized race, we internalize it. A friend of mine says we all drink the same dirty water in some senses, right? Um, you know, and so the imposter syndrome takes on a very different, different meaning, but it's great mm -hmm. that you noticed it and, you know, you, pl you plowed through. So I guess it's not there anymore. No, <laughs> they're getting all of their money's worth. <laughs> Trust me. I can tell. I can tell, Penny. I think it's. I think you debunk, debunk that. You know, debunk that, that that particular myth. So, what would you say to people who are not maybe as vocal, um, not not the type to email their CEO? They're not there yet. How can they fight the fight? What are the alternatives? What are other ways? You know, I think there are just so many different ways. There is no one way. I mean, there will be women like me that, you know, and that's my, my you know, that's my role, right? It's to kind of be be an articulate voice that that knows and understands these things and, you know, uses my, my, my position to do that. Um, you know, I think it's just important to be, you know, to be who you are and don't, what is it, see racism as a distraction because you're not feeling guilty that you're not contributing in the way that other people are contributing. I think the important thing is to have, is to take a position, you know, is, is to take a position. And however you articulate that, um, and that might be saying, it might be reading, it might be writing, 
you know, it might be the one-to-one -one conversation that you're having. Um, you know, I, I know, for example, in the Nigerian community, it's been fascinating. I love my community, they're really fascinating. Me too. Yeah, the assumptions that are made, that they really get what issues of racism are, I'm, that there's lots of work to even do in our, our communities. Um, so there are many different ways of being that voice, whether it's the mentoring of you know, young black girls in school or but what we do know is that silence, mm -hmm. right? Abdicating, stepping out of the arena, turning a blind eye is not going to deliver the change that we want to see, right? That's, that's just not, that's, that's not going to deliver that. Mm -hmm. So there is somewhere where our voice, and maybe it's also becoming part of a collective voice, so that you're part of Ladies That Lunch, that your collective voice, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so you're coming together as a tribe, and, and maybe this is a moment to begin to look at, again, kind of what is our purpose? Mm -hmm. You know, why do we exist in, in this moment? For such a time as this, why do we exist? Mm. Might be something to, to think about. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you're out there with placards. You might be ladies at lunch, Black Lives Matter. I don't know. Um, it doesn't mean that, but it means something. Mm. It does mean something. And, and maybe it's an opportunity for you to kind of explore what that looks like. It's funny you should say that actually because I am now at a point where I'm quite openly, I can say it here, battling with the fact that Ladies at Lunch is intended as a safe space and I, as the leader of it, want to protect that. But then I also feel like we are a voice that needs to be amplified and if we don't own our narrative, as we've said, who's going to say it for us? So we also need to be vocal. So I, I'm always in the middle of that balance. Yeah. Mm. And, and you know, so the safe space that you've created serves a purpose mm -hmm. and what you can find in these safe spaces that we create is that it's a safe space to unburden a safe space to have the conversations maybe that we wouldn't have and that is important but what's the end goal mm -hmm. so that we you know if i was coaching i'd say so that we can do what mm -hmm. so that we'll be remembered for what mm -hmm. So that our legacy will look like fill in the blank. Mm. Yeah. So I think that's the, that is the question. Yes, and I've again networks like this are really important because in organizations, those safe spaces don't necessarily exist. You know, we looked at gen different women looked at gender networks, and the question was asked, like, you know, how relevant are gender networks for you as different women? And different women are black. Asian and ethnically diverse women who make a difference to the world. Only 12% said that gender ne networks work for them. Only 12%. And so, and it was also found that gender is not a unifying factor. So the fact that myself and um, Amy Cooper, let's not talk about her, are both women, let's leave her, let's leave her alone for now. That's another conversation, that's another conversation, right? Because we looked at the relationship between black women and white women, and that was an interesting revelation. Um, but there's absolutely something in no safe spaces. So we create a safe space for ourselves, but let's together, collectively, we're looking at our context and we know that our context is asking for our leadership. What is our leadership response? Mm. Right, so what's what's the optics of ladies at lunch that are different women coming together that are silent on these issues? Mm. I know, yeah. I, I, I know. That, I needed that I needed that reassurance because I, I feel like obviously I have a duty to the ladies in my group, but I, I also have a duty to amplify that voice. So I needed that reassurance. Um I'm glad you said that. Um, I've and got another I question, think, actually. I think also Sorry. the women in your group are amazing and exceptional enough. Let's stop underestimating the value that we bring 
mm -hmm. right? As different women, as black, brown women, as black. But let's not underestimate what that looks like. Go back, we don't even need to go back far in terms of our history. And that you are in this moment, in spite of the kind of, you know, rocky waters that you're swimming in, look at what you've achieved and own that. And it's five times more than your white female counterpart. That's evidence. <laughs> the court has shown that black women in particular are more ambitious than their white female counterparts. So I, I, I don't underestimate the power of the network that you have at all. That's very valid. So we've got probably time for one last question. And um, the person thought it wasn't appropriate, but I think it is. Um, so this person has approached their HR regarding regarding the BLM movement, and they haven't because her company hasn't said anything on the matter. There's been no calls. Um, she feels very good in herself that she has sent um, sent the email regardless of just joining the company. But is there a good time for a response? And is she being a bit uh, um, to see what they say. I, I mean, first of all, just again, you know, when I said in your network, you've got some amazing examples of leadership. That is an example of courageous, bold, you know, uncompromising, unapologetic leadership. Think about it. This is a young this is a woman this is new to the role mm. and can look around and see what's happening. I'm, I'm having a webinar and I, I really hope that we will be connected um, following on from this. I'm going to be hosting, I'm going to be hosting a webinar which is asked kind of Black Lives Matter is HR, OD and diversity and inclusion fit for purpose. Now let, let's look at HR in terms of its profile, predominantly white woman, predominantly. Yeah? Um, some people call HR human remains as opposed to human resources. Oh, I've never heard that one. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, HR human remains. Um, and I think there's an expectation that HR will be the part of the system that will advocate on behalf of all employees. And actually HR, you know, in terms of human resources, are actually part of the system and their role really is to uphold the organization. That's what their job, that is what their job is. So it's it's important to calibrate. I've again run many and I'll continue to run, you know, had many conversations with HR who can sometimes be a big blocker to diversity and inclusion, particularly when it comes to, to race. I, I, you know, there are very few, and I mean, I think, you know, I'm not taking away from my HR colleagues, but that, that, that we are on, they're on a journey. They are on, 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 on a journey. And because human is in the title does not mean that there isn't lot to learn. Humans have bias. We've already established that, right? So in terms of is there is a good time, now is the time. Um, is there a good time to respond? It will look back in years to come, just like Colin Kaepernick, right? We'll, look back in years to come and we'll know the organizations, we'll know the brands that stood the test of time. Right? We, we will absolutely know. Okay, so you put up this, this sign and you, you come out and you said we stand with in solidarity of, so what's, what's the reality? And that's where it's our role to be strategic and continue in our own ways to do what that young woman has done. And thank you for that. I really honor you and just say thank you. Um, and to do what she's done and keep doing it. You know, leadership is risky, mm. right? It's, you know, it, it's absolutely risky. It's, it is about stepping, it's about putting your head above the parapet, mm. but it's worth it. Yeah. It might save a life, it might save a career, mm. right? It might save a baby in hospital, you know, it, it might save a young girl who, for the first time, you're speaking up and teachers are responding differently. Mm. So kind of get that into our mindsets. Mm. Wow. Eve, I'm good. any final thoughts from you? Or I'll let you close out. That was Trying amazing. absorb it all because yeah, there's so many lessons to take away, but you know, even I'm 
sitting here and you know I acknowledge that I haven't owned my whole narrative I'm just like let me go and start and I think yeah it's so reassuring to hear your experiences and your encouragement I think that's what what the ladies in our network need as well um so so we're here we're going to continue to to encourage them too and to put it into practice because i think seeing one another doing it and getting that feedback and hearing about all the positive stories and even the challenging ones are really what's what's making the difference right now. uh thank you so much carol thank you so much for having me um, I know that no, what you're no. doing makes a difference. Sorry, Tenny, you were saying. I just wanted to say, I hope this is the start of a long lasting relationship because I think there's a lot that we can learn from you and we want to be part of different women, different places. And sure. yeah, I think we're, there's a lot to learn. I've de definitely taken a lot away. And I know that this conversation was so needed for a lot of the ladies in the network and beyond we have people from outside of LTL who have tuned in today so very grateful for you for taking the time and thanks. looking forward thanks. to hearing from you again. thanks for having Sorry. me you take care now take you can care. all go have some real lunch yeah <laughs> <laughs>